All right, Durf. Wonderful. So uh, I can't see everybody out there, but I hope there's a bunch of participation, participation out on the, the Facebook. My name is Durf Johnson. I'm the Clean Water Program Director and Staff Attorney for the Montana Environmental Information Center. We're a Helena-based organization that advocates for, among a bunch of different things, clean water. And I'd like uh, to welcome you today to our Lunch and Learn. What we're trying to accomplish today is provide you with a really high level uh, set of information on nutrient pollution, how it's regulated in Montana, um, how it potentially could be regulated under some pretty significant changes with the Montana legislature and the DEQ making, and some of our concerns. And with me today, I have two people who are probably the foremost experts in their respective fields here in Montana. And that is uh, Sarah Zuzalak with Zuzalak Environmental, who does, uh, she's a professional engineer and does consulting work um, around the state. And uh, Guy Allsenser, who is the executive director and an attorney with Upper Missouri Waterkeeper and does a lot of work on the Clean Water Act here in Montana. So, um, Without ado, I'm going to introduce these two, or really allow for them to introduce themselves. We have a pretty tight agenda, and then we're going to dive into some questions. And questions can be dropped into the Facebook chat, I believe, um, and those will be relayed to us and we'll be able to answer them. So, Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself and provide some background? Sure. Thank you, Durf. Um, as Durf said, my name is Sarah Zuzalak. I'm an independent consulting engineer based in Bozeman. My educational background includes a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's in environmental engineering. I'm a registered professional engineer in the state of Montana. I have over 20 years of experience working primarily with conservation groups in the state, providing technical advocacy support with the objective to minimize environmental impacts and community impacts, in particular associated with mining. Over that time, I've really gained an expertise in development, developing and implementing water monitoring programs, data analysis and reporting designed to assess for nutrient related impacts, and identification of water management and treatment technologies to improve water quality associated with my discharge. Most recently, I developed um, what's called a water resources adaptive management plan on behalf of Northern Plains. And that's a plan that's designed to monitor for, identify and mitigate impacts from permitted nutrient discharge from a mine site. This is an approach that's proposed by the supporters of SB 358 to implement the narrative standards and they'll come back in what we're talking about through the lunch and learn. Like other presenters, I've been highly engaged as a stakeholder in DEQ's nutrient working group as a technical representative for development of this uh, narrative rule for nutrients. And for that, I'm representing both environmental advocacy and conservation groups. Thank you guys for attending today, Guy. Hi folks in the internet land. My name is Guy Allsenser. I'm the executive director and staff attorney at Upper Missouri Waterkeeper. We are a 501c3 clean water advocacy organization based out of Bozeman, but we work throughout uh, a huge breadth of Montana. And much of the work that we do, although inherently focused on water quality in our neck of the woods, has rippling effects throughout the state. Um, so what the heck, uh, why would you wanna to listen to me? Well, as a preliminary matter, I, I got the degree background. Similar to Sarah, we, we all put in a lot of time trying to figure out uh, what are the rules and what are the uh, baselines for understanding how our system works, who gets to do what, uh, and what does it take to actually create a clean and healthy environment? And when it comes to those rules, that's where my specialty lies. I have a Juris Doctorate, which is a law degree, and I also have a Master's in Science um, and about 15 years of experience specializing explicitly in federal and state environmental law. 
So when it comes to the topic uh, du jour, what I can offer is a unique perspective on where we are today. Uh, how did we get here with the current rulemaking from the Montana DEQ and uh, the Senate Bill 358 that it came from? And I'll also be able to offer a perspective on where it does or does not comply with mandatory requirements of federal law, which the state of Montana has to follow. Um, and with that said, I think that I'm the first on the agenda here to dig into some of the details and uh, I'll, I'll get right into it, which is a great description of hopefully uh, educational about how did we get here? Uh, and what are we really talking about today? What we're talking about is a law that was passed out of the 2021 legislative session. Its name is Senate Bill 358. Senate Bill 358 has a very long and turbid history that uh, unfortunately I'm involved with to the extent that uh, over five years ago, we adopted really strong science-based standards on how do we protect water quality. And when I say strong, I mean they were numeric expressions of the concentrations of pollutants that can go into water that can cause harmful algal blooms, uh, that can create fish kills, and that can contaminate rivers for other uses of water. And why are these standards important? Well, first of all, EPA nationally has said, hey, states, you guys need to put these rules on the books because they offer a nonpartisan, empirically demonstrated basis that allows us to, on one hand, protect clean water, and on the other hand, easily determine when a waterway is unhealthy. That being said, when we put those rules on the books, it was very visionary. Not many states in the nation have actually taken this step for a variety of reasons, but Montana did take that step, and that's great. Unfortunately, we also uh, put forward a number of different exemptions that categorically got rid of those protections for waterways and allowed polluters to do almost anything they want or nothing at all to better protect water quality. So uh, here we are about a year ago and uh, the stake of those exemptions, the idea of getting away from science-based standards was uh, undermined and the polluters in our state were really concerned and they went to the legislature and the legislature listened, unfortunately, exclusively to polluting interests, and they passed this law. And what this law really talks about is eliminating wholesale a proven science-based approach to controlling pollution at its source and to likewise being able to understand where and how a waterway gets polluted and to be able to fix it, uh, which is to say to eliminate those sources of pollution and restore that waterway to health. So why is this all important? It's important because we're in Montana. We all value so much the value of clean, uh, readily available water. And what's really at stake is the idea of whether or not science is going to guide the way of protecting uh, local water quality from harmful algal blooms and nutrient pollution. And I'd say uh, that's about the extent of how did we get here? And I want to toss the microphone over to Sarah to get a little bit more in the weeds about what are the impacts of nutrient pollution? And uh, likewise, what are these criteria that you hear about and why is one better than the other? Sarah. Thanks Guy, and maybe not the weeds, but the filamentous algae, like, like what we see in this image here, of the, the green muck we're Very talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Can't help it. So, um, I mean, numeric standards like Guy described, were adopted in Montana for nitrogen and phosphorus in 2015 after several years of development. The numeric water quality standards are protective of water quality, they're science-based, and they were developed based on a robust data set with limits established for specific ecoregions throughout the state. The numeric standards were non-degradation are, are non-degradation-based, um, and they were developed to protect Montana's surface water from nutrient-based pollution. Numeric standards provide a clear process to determine permit limits to allow discharges to our waters. For example, a point source discharge permit has a limit established that's based on maintaining water quality and beneficial use. These numeric science-based standards prevent pollution as opposed to responding to it. Now that said, having the numeric limits was not perfect, but it's a far better system than what's proposed with the narrative approach. So conversely, the narrative standards are a huge backslide for Montana's water quality. They take a pollution management approach 
and require action only after a beneficial use of a river has been impaired. The narrative standards would replace numeric concentration-based standards with subjective biology-based response variables. Now monitoring for both water chemistry and algae levels is really important to understanding and evaluating the impacts to a river from a discharge. But these biology-based standards like measuring algae levels in a river should not be relied upon for decision-making as proposed in this rulemaking framework. There are too many factors outside of a discharger's control that influence algae levels. So these response variables to replace numeric standards really are just too dependent on several factors outside of the nutrient levels discharge. And it's gonna make it really difficult to, for DEQ to determine a cause effect relationship from a specific source discharge. The narrative standards also prioritize phosphorus. They wanna minimize phosphorus over nitrogen discharges, which effectively would allow for more nitrogen loading into our streams, um, which I view as a ticking time bomb. Nitrogen can persist in our waters and move downstream, leaving a high potential for unintended water quality impacts beyond the point of discharge. By prioritizing phosphorus, um, this rule cannot be protective of our water quality. Phosphorus and nitrogen both must be limited to protect Montana's water quality from nutrient impairment. So next slide, please. I think now that we've you know, talked a little bit about nutrient water quality standards and how those limits are set to protect our water, let's take a step back. What is nutrient pollution? Nutrient pollution is the loading of nitrogen and phosphorus to groundwater that results in adverse impacts, like the algae blooms and fish kills shown in these images. Algae blooms are caused by too much nitrogen and phosphorus in our rivers. They're harmful to fish and other wildlife. They undermine public health and recreation, and they can negatively impact irrigation water for agriculture. Nutrient pollution is a significant issue in the state of Montana. In fact, it's the leading cause of water quality impairment in our state. Nutrient pollution impacts 35% of Montana's river miles, 22% of lakes, and DEQ's most recent water quality integrated report from 2020 identified over 200 rivers and streams in the state that are currently impaired by nitrogen or phosphorus, not just nitrogen. So where does the nitrogen come from? Common sources of nutrients that contain nitrogen and can cause this pollution come from point source discharges, typically from a city municipality or an industrial operation. For example, water discharge to a river from a city wastewater treatment plant, treated water discharged from a mine operation or process plant, and industrial stormwater discharges. These types of discharges are regulated by DEQ by permit and contain limits on nitrogen and phosphorus that are currently based on the numeric nutrient criteria. Now there's also point source and generally unpermitted discharges that can result in nutrient pollution contributing to water quality impairment. Examples of that are agricultural runoff from fertilizer and livestock feeding operations, unregulated stormwater runoffs, and maybe that faulty septic system that's providing inputs in that, that new riverside subdivision. Impacts from this pollution really are well understood. That's not a question um, that's up for debate as part of this new rule. Too much nitrogen and phosphorus in the water cause algae in our rivers and lakes to grow faster than the ecosystem can handle. Significant increases in these algae levels harm water quality, food resources, and habitat. They decrease oxygen that, that fish and other aquatic life need to survive. The algae blooms can clog waterways, impacting human health and recreation. They promote discoloration of water and they reduce the ability of aquatic life to find food. Um, 
hopefully this um, can help you understand better why it's so important that we maintain our numeric water quality criteria for nutrients that are protective. Guy? Thanks, Sarah. Hopefully the Science 101 was helpful to understanding a little bit of why we should care, right? Uh, how do these pollutants actually get into our waterways and what type of impacts do they actually create? And, and how is that all a raw deal for the public? Uh, not just you know, conservation organizations, but you, normal people, you wanna have uh, low tax bills. You don't wanna have high rates for water pollution treatment. You wanna be able to go fish. You wanna be able to go swim. Why do you live in Montana? I would argue probably most of you want to live here because it's a rad outdoor space and we get to have a unique Western way of life that is largely predicated on a clean and healthy environment. So at its most basic, what I'm here to tell you today is what we're looking at is a rulemaking that threatens to undermine the basis for rules that protect your ability to go out and use water to turn on your tap, uh, to experience low utility bills, and to have clarity, knowing that, in fact, your government is doing its job to limit pollution sources on the basis of science, not politics, into our waterways. So let's talk a little bit about that process. One of the things that the, the Senate bill from the last legislative session laid out is that, number one, it categorically said we're getting rid of the science and we're throwing it out the door. That, of course, gives us massive heartburn as a legal issue as well as a practical issue. Another part that's really troubling is that the state doesn't have the authority to just wholesale throw things out the door, right? What they have to do is actually submit these, uh, these fundamental revisions of its water quality rules to the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, and EPA is the federal backstop here. Think of them as the big brother that's protecting the little child. They're here to make sure that you're not going to make some sort of crazy, rash decision. Uh, and theoretically, that big brother is there to help you, right? Not to beat you up. They're there to help you. And the idea is, uh, when we're talking about water pollution rules, a state can't just do whatever it wants. It has to meet minimum requirements of federal law. And one of those minimum requirements is anytime it wants to change standards that protect our way of life, our, our stream health, et cetera, EPA has to approve it. Well, guess what? Again, Senate Bill 358, what did it do? Threw the rules out the door immediately. And then what else happened? It said, we're going to pursue something that's a completely unproven new system for controlling and looking at uh, nutrient pollution. And why is that troubling? Well, number one, this is a complex issue. If Sarah uh, wasn't here and you had me to do it, I mean, I, I would be lost. It's so voluminous, right? Scientific data, how do we protect uses of water? Who has to do what? It's complex. And what the law said is we're tossing out a 50-year-old program that's proven to reduce pollution and to hold sectors accountable to control their personal pollution impacts on a waterway. We're tossing that out the window, and now we're going to create a brand new system. And that system, by the way, is based largely on political interests. Uh, the sideboards, such as they are within the law, are largely unenforceable. They don't have transparency about when and how much pollution has to be reduced. And a ton of discretion is given to the people that are putting pollution in the water to fix the problem. So let's think about that. Does the fox guard the hen house? I would argue, no, the fox does not guard the hen house. And what we have here and what's at stake is not only are we ignoring science underneath of this new rulemaking proposal, but we're putting forward a new rule-based program that's fundamentally separated from a proven control framework that actually reduces pollution. But don't worry, the DEQ is going to put forward something different. So if you take anything away from my, uh, my bit and contribution today, it would be number one, tell DEQ this process isn't going to use a proven system for controlling pollution. And that concerns me as a citizen. And number two, you should tell DEQ, hey, I'm fundamentally aware that you're not using established proven criteria that are already adopted at law. And that also greatly concerns me. Tell DEQ, use good science that's already established and approved by our federal regulators. Sarah, I think it goes back to you. Um, well, I have one thing I do want to add, just, just building on what you said. I think that you'll hear DEQ and uh, the proponents of SB 358 
talk about these adaptive management plans. And these adaptive management plans are gonna contain all of the tools that will protect our water quality, just trust us. I think an issue that's important to highlight in this round of comments is that we, we shouldn't be approving a rule that requires an adaptive management plan until the detail has been uh, defined of what's required in that plan. And we need to ensure that these plans are still protective of water quality from degradation and that they do contain a process and framework for how to return water quality to healthy conditions in the event a discharge causes impairment. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, I want to bring it all back to uh, some big picture ideas. The first is that uh, clean water matters in Montana, and I can't overstate that enough whether your business depends on it because you're a guiding service or because um, you rely on clean water as a brewery um, or you're a rancher. It's very important that you have access to clean water or if it's just coming out of your tap and you wanna make sure that it's safe. And so thankfully uh, we have a constitution that requires public engagement in these types of processes. And so as Guy referenced, there's a rulemaking process that's associated with this. And the Department of Environmental Quality as part of that process has to listen to you. They have to accept public comment and they have to evaluate it. Now that can be a little bit daunting because this is a complex issue, um, but I've asked for our, our tech savvy uh, administrator here to drop some things into the Facebook chat. Um, first off is each of our organizations has created fact sheets and action alerts that um, help to guide you through this process and give you the background knowledge that you need. And the second thing is that comments on this rulemaking process need to be in by February 8th. And uh, our tech savvy person has also dropped that actual rulemaking document with what they're, the details of exactly what they're proposing into um, the Facebook chat so that you can see uh, for yourself and read for yourself. And finally, our constitution thankfully also requires a public meeting. And on February 8th, as you'll see in that rulemaking document, you can sign up and actually provide testimony and tell the DEQ Tell the Gianforte administration exactly what you think about this, uh, this, this narrative standard. So with that, um, I don't know if we uh, have any questions at this point. If not, I certainly have some. Um, let me just check here. So um, to start off with, uh, Sarah, I would like for you, if you could, <laughs> to just talk a little bit about some of your actual experience in developing the adaptive management plan up in, uh, I believe it was Stillwater County. And um, some of the, some of the um, major issues that were encountered. Okay, thanks, sir. Um, yes, so with Northern Plains and uh, their partnerships in the Good Neighbor Agreement with Stillwater Mining Company, I've worked to develop adaptive management plans to address discharges associated with the mine operations that are both point and non-point discharges. And um, I think that the, the framework's goal, or excuse me, the adaptive management plan goal is to maintain baseline water quality in those rivers, which is an objective of the good neighbor agreement. So what we did is we took 20 years of you know, historical monitoring data and use that to identify baseline conditions as the first trigger and the numeric water quality standards as the you know, most significant action trigger. And if those triggers are hit within downgrading groundwater and surface water locations um, that are identified with the adaptive management plan, the response framework within that plan defines the action steps of process and timeframe for verifying the results 
increasing the monitoring frequency and hiring expertise to make a decision on how to mitigate the impacts. Um, I think important takeaways that when you try to translate something like that into a rulemaking and a permit structure, um, it took about three years with multi-stakeholders to develop one adaptive management plan and the specific details that go into that. And without that knowledge of both biological water chemistry and physical water monitoring data to inform decision-making, I think you know, landing on those triggers and having something enforceable would be, would be very difficult. So I think the takeaways are adaptive management plans are time consuming. They require expertise to develop and implement and continual improvement to track and rely on that plan to ensure that uh, a discharge is, is not impairing our water. Excellent. And Mr. Allsensor, I uh, had to do that. What is a rollback in the Clean Water Act? And conceptually, how does that apply in this circumstance? Uh, how would you think about it? Thank you, Counselor. Let me ask you answer your question. First and foremost, a rollback is when a standard or a rule is changed. And obviously the connotation from rollback is that it's a negative thing. Uh, and when we talk about a rollback here with this idea of Montana rolling back its strong numeric nutrient standards, and instead of using those, putting forward its narrative standards, we are in fact suggesting we're replacing a proven good thing with the weaker, worse thing. Uh, and in the legal context, when you replace a standard uh, that protects local water quality, you have to get EPA approval and sign off before you're allowed to do so. One of the biggest problems with Senate Bill 358 that has plagued the last nine months of uh, formulating this rulemaking has been the idea that the legislature acted on its own without looking at what does binding federal law require. This wasn't a thoughtful process. This was instead a knee-jerk reaction to special interests saying we wanted to have uh, our way. We didn't want to have to meet stringent standards that protect water quality. We think they're, they're burdensome uh, and we don't want to do it. And so the state passed its own law. And what's that resulted in? Well, it's resulted in a rollback, but it's not going through lawful process. And unfortunately, it seems to lack uh, both a scientific basis and as Sarah has described, it doesn't uh, tee up with any of the existing examples of how a meaningful adaptive management plan could work in other circumstances in Montana. And Guy, it looks like we now have a question from the audience. What other states have a narrative uh, standard or a narrative plan and how is their water doing? <laughs> That's a softball question. Uh, roughly three quarters of the United States still have narrative standards. They've never adopted numeric standards. And the example across the nation is that most states are doing very poorly. Um, and usually what that's recognized is saying, uh, not only do states every two years assess their waters and come up with what they call an integrated report that lists all the pollution problems in waters, but EPA compiles all that data as well. And nationally, the number one pollution problem we have for water quality is nutrient pollution, i.e. toxic algae blooms, you know, polluted water sources, fish kills. This is the most pervasive water quality pollution problem of our time. You know, that all these rules came on the books 50 years ago because rivers were on fire from industrial pollution. We weren't even worried about nutrients at that time. Well, we've done a really good job with the industrial and commercial sectors, but what we haven't done a good job with is controlling nutrients. So now it's time to work on those. And across the country, states that have not implemented uh, numeric standards, they don't have much to stand on and it's really hard to enforce narrative standards. And that's why uh, the lack of success and progress is because they're not using the right tools on their tool belt. Um, and that's why it's so important that Montana keeps the proper tools on its tool belt that allows us to either protect what's clean or to fix what's dirty. And we have another uh, question, I believe, probably for Guy. Um, and that is, where is the EPA on this? 
and uh, have they provided any initial indications or uh, any uh, direction as to whether they're going to accept this change? Boy, I, I, I have that same question. EPA has participated in the what DEQ has a roundtable. They call it the Nutrient Work Group. EPA has been showing up in terms of representatives uh, attending it. And I like to think of it as they're trying to inform themselves about what's going on. But the problem here is that EPA can't be a friend and a regulator at the same time. Uh, and EPA's first primary job under the law is to hold states accountable to faithfully implement uh, you know, strong pollution protections that protect the public trust, protect your right to fishable, swimmable, drinkable water. So although EPA has physically shown up, they're not doing their job. Uh, to that point, my organization filed a, a formal petition to EPA uh, back in May of last year, right after the passage of Senate Bill 358, formally asking them to take action on this new legislative uh, rule and uh, package because we said fundamentally it doesn't comply with your and my right to clean water and to science-based protections. And sadly, they've not answered our petition uh, and they've stood by why the DEQ puts forward a rule package that, as you've heard today, lacks a legal basis, lacks a strong scientific basis, and it doesn't jibe with any of the proven examples of how a uh, outside the box alternative framework could work to give a win-win situation, which means on the whole, it's high time for EPA to get off of uh, its hands, stop sitting on your hands, use your hands, and uh, you know, let's nip this in the bud and go back to what works. Okay, this is an all play. Um, where can people access the data on water quality uh, for states with narrative standards? Is it available on an EPA site or somewhere else that people can access that data? Yes, uh, I would suggest that people Google search uh, the acronym EPA and the acronym ECHO, E-C-H-O. The ECHO database uh, is a great way for you to look up uh, what's going on. You can also look up EPA and Know My Watershed. Uh, all of those will bring up interactive mapping tools hosted by National EPA. And you can literally identify your state and your home watershed, and you can look at conditions. And all of this, again, comes from aggregated data that EPA pulls from uh, its own sources, as well as from state regulators. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add, Sarah. Next question. For Sarah. And uh, this is one of our slides said that um, polluters get to regulate themselves. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of a narrative standard and how this process of adaptive management plan might work? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, I guess I'm, as an eternal optimist, I'm, I'm hoping that um, there's still opportunity to have DEQ maintain control of, of regulating permits. But as this is proposed and being discussed in the nutrient work group sessions, the, the discharger um, or the, the polluter, if you will, is required to develop, to develop the adaptive management plan. They're required to identify all other potential sources of nutrient related impairment within that watershed and then themselves prioritize which of the discharges um, might be mo give you the most bang for your buck if you will in um, implementing improvements to um, address water quality impairments. So effectively what that does, I think, is allows a, a lot of finger pointing that it's not my point source discharge, it's the, it's the non-point source downstream or that's this other source in the watershed, watershed. And we should be looking at having DEQ require improvements there, not on my discharge. So that, that I think is a big difference. And what we're proposing in our comments and, and approach in the, the nutrient work group is to have DEQ main, can maintain control of the adaptive management program and allow dischargers to still uh, require dischargers to provide a monitoring plan and response framework specific to their operation. I'll piggyback on Sarah's comments very briefly to make two points. First and foremost, what we're seeing right now with this new narrative rulemaking is a race to the bottom. Let's be very clear. Let me state that again. We're seeing a race to the bottom. 
when you get rid of a proven regulatory framework for controlling water pollution from the most pervasive pollution types in the country, and we do it in the headwaters of our country, in Montana, right? We're the headwaters. doesn't get any more clean than us. This is the last thing that we want to be doing if we want to protect the golden goose of our economy and the things that drive us to stay here, raise our families here, and, and you know, create business opportunities here. Uh, narrative standards take away the responsibility of major polluters from having to meet clear limits on their pollution sources. Um, most sectors in Montana across the board can do substantially more than they're doing right now to protect local water quality on the basis of best available science. The fact that they don't want to do so is very different from saying, I can't. And there's a big point of contention. Number two point I wanna make is when we talk about the adaptive management rule part of this framework, that's also what's so troubling and what Sarah just pointed out. The way in which the adaptive management plan rules are framed don't have a lot of the hallmarks of informed decision making. There's not a lot of transparency. There's not much accountability. And there's a massive passing of the buck in terms of ultimately who is responsible to make sure that waterways don't become degraded or get worse in terms of their nutrient pollution and ongoing degradation. This is all very concerning uh, and the public should chime in. Thank you, Guy. Um, I'd like to ask for each of you if you have any parting thoughts before we end our program today. Um, and uh, you'll notice that we have up here our contact information. And I would suggest anybody in the audience, don't hesitate to reach out to us. If you're preparing comments, consider us a resource and we'll try and help as best we can. Parting thoughts, folks? Um, I'll jump in. Thank you, everyone, for your attendance to the Lunch and Learn. I hope it was helpful to you. Just to reiterate um, what Durf said, please take the time to submit comments. I think they, they do make a difference. If you need support, I know that there's been some, some really helpful links on public commenting and suggested language or talking points that you can use and, and reach out if you have questions. Thank you. Ditto what Sarah said. Remember, be proud to be a Montanan. Uh, and being proud isn't enough. Take action. Put sentiment and deed together. Submit comments. Even if they're as simple as saying, I don't want us to walk away from science, you need to use the proven existing system. Follow the law. It doesn't matter. Stand up. Raise your voice for clean water. Your voice does matter in our state. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everyone.